right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear us okay, and welcome to the final session of the day. We've saved the best for last, really, with uh, a real wide-ranging discussion on the, on the labour market. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the big structural long-term trends. Uh, we're going to talk about wages. We're going to talk about the knock-on effects of inflation. And we're going to talk about what we should be taking from all this for policy. Got an absolutely fantastic panel uh, to talk through all this with you. So on my far left, we have uh, Catherine Nice, uh, Deputy Head of Global Economics at Pigeon Fixed Income and Chief European Economist. Catherine, amongst many other things, uh, keeps a close eye on what's happening on uh, Bank of England's uh, interest rate policy. Uh, immediate left, we've got uh, Jonathan Haskell, external member of the Monetary Policy Committee and Professor of Economics at Imperial Business College. Uh, research interests of Jonathan include uh, productivity, growth and innovation and much more. And far right, um, we have uh, Alan Manning, Professor of Economics at the LSE and probably the UK's foremost labour markets expert. You don't mind me uh, saying that, Alan. <laughs> so the pressure's on. <laughs> Uh, and the way we're going to run this is um, a little bit different to some of the earlier sessions because we've got a lot to get through. Um, we're going to split it into sort of three mini sessions. We're going to start with um, some of the structural big picture labour market trends on the demand side and on the supply side. We're then going to move on as our second session to wage dynamics and the structural rate of unemployment. And then we're going to finish by putting the pieces of the jigsaw together standing back and asking what policymakers can take from the labour market in the UK at the moment. After each of these mini sessions, I'm going to break and come to the audience for questions. So you'll have not one, not two, but three opportunities to uh, ask our panel questions. So with that all in mind, um, we're going to start really, really big picture. Um, we're going to start on some of the big technological trends shaping labour market demand. Uh, I think it's hard to pick up a newspaper or a, read a blog at the moment without uh, reading some pretty uh, dire predictions about what AI and automation uh, mean for jobs. And Catherine, if I can come to you first, just um, help us navigate through the hype and what impact is this really having at the moment for us in the UK? Well, thank you, uh, Lee, and thanks also to the organizers for inviting me. I hope I can make some small positive contribution to the really great discussion so far today. Um, and I've got a couple charts. If it doesn't work out, it's, it's, it's not the, the end of the world. Um, but let me start just by saying, you know, when, when I first thought about this question around the impact of AI, um, my, the immediate thought I had was this is just another version of the sort of lump of labor fallacy that is that there is a fixed number of jobs and if technological change or increases in the supply of labor coming from immigration or women entering the labor force, then there will be fewer jobs left for everybody else. And I think uh, examples from history are pretty persuasive that uh, that is not really how, how the world works. Um, and I think the UK actually, uh, over the last couple of decades does give um, a good example of that. So, you know, these are really just uh, quite straightforward slides on uh, UK, US, Euro area, looking first at population growth on the left-hand side. And you can see that for the UK, you know, we had very high population growth. On the right-hand chart, you can see labor participation rates where, again, the UK, you know, compares very favorably relative to the US and the Euro area, not only with much higher participation rates, but really having been on an um, upward trend over a long period of time. So lots of labor supply into the UK economy. And yet, if we look at more sort of demand side indicators, we can see that on the left, unemployment was actually lower and less variable relative to uh, these other um, economic regions. And the reason for that really was the UK was effectively a job generating machine uh, for the decades in the run up to the pre pandemic. Now, it's not all, you know, sunshine and light because there were lots of issues around particularly low productivity and skills. And that sort of brings me back to this issue on 
AI uh, because, you know, by all accounts, um, we already have a skills issue in the UK, a long-standing one, and uh, technological chain, change, I think, uh, risks exacerbating this skills deficit. And although uh, I think, you know, history tells us that this lump of labor uh, is in fact a, a fallacy, it's not to say that the transition is, is easy. Um, and it, it's not easy, it's very challenging, and it's particularly challenging, you know, for a lot of individuals who find their roles um, having been displaced. So um, at, at my uh, firm, we've done some internal work on the future of the labor supply, and the numbers are really big. Uh, if you look at potential displacement from AI for Europe and the US, you know, the numbers that, that we're seeing are things like 30 million. That's practically half the population of the UK. So clearly this is not going to be easy. And in addition to some of the good things I think that uh, UK policymakers did in terms of active labor market policies, flexible labor market policies, there is clearly a very big role to play in terms of skills and ensuring that uh, you know, individuals are enabled to maximize the benefit from AI and to make this transition. And so there is a big role here for public policy, but it doesn't have to necessarily be, um, you know, an, a negative thing as long as policy is adapting. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And perhaps, Alan, I can come to you on these challenges around transition, around change, around skills and the skills deficit in the UK. Um, well, I think we've had a very long-standing problem with a sort of uh, a sort of tail of really, you know, quite quite low-skilled people, and that's been with us for uh, for decades. Um, I'm not sure that I feel that because of AI, we need to sort of be ever even more vigilant than we should have been in the past um, about that. I do think that. There's a tendency to sort of exaggerate the impacts of all new technologies. I mean, for example, I, I don't know, some of you may recall like 10 years ago in 2013, everyone was worrying about robots. And there was a paper which said that, um, you know, 40% of US employment was a high risk of automation within a decade or two. Well, we're halfway through that decade or two, and we're talking about labor shortages. Uh, rather than um, you know, you know, no, you know, the end of work, um, and I think it's not the mistake that is often made in thinking about the labour market impacts of it, is that a lot of the focus is often on saying, well, there are going to be new jobs will emerge and people will do those, whereas in fact, I think what happens when firms are adopting new technology because they're doing that because they're ch it's cheaper. And um, as long as the markets work reasonably well, those lower costs should feed through into lower prices. And as a result, every, all, everybody, consumers, now can buy what they did before and have some money left over. And as they spend that on, um, on you know, everything, they raise the demand for labor there. So, you know, ironically, you know, some of the biggest gainers from technological change, I think, have been hairdressers. Um, or even though that sort of sounds a bit um, surprised. So it's not all about new skills. It's not all about um, new jobs. It's just a reallocation of labor from this job to that job. Thanks, Alan. And uh, Jonathan, perhaps if I could just uh, bring you in here. I mean, as Catherine says, a big role for public policy potentially, but clearly well beyond the scope and remit of the Bank of England. But perhaps you can just give us a bit of a flavor how some of these longer term structural trends might uh, impacts upon the broader kind of policy? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. And, and, and it touches on um, what the earlier people in the conference talked about, um, which is, of course, endless crises displace the opportunity to think about these more medium term, um, uh, you know, type of tendencies that Alan and Catherine are talking about. Could I just provide a little bit more colour on what they were saying? So one of the benefits of this job is you actually go out to visit some real firms. Uh, and I was at a gardening um, supplies firm in Newcastle recently, and they'd um, put in a load of AI. And what they had is they had a series of customer relations managers who would email the answers to questions that all the clients were sending in. And it turned out 
that the answers to the questions that the clients were say, selling in were all actually on the firm's website. And had the customers taken the trouble to consult the firm's website, they would have found the answer immediately. Um, and, a piece, and, and some AI technology, which they developed with the local university, turned out to just completely automate that task. So from that, I draw two um, conclusions. One is... People think about jobs, and as David Orter at MIT has taught us, I think it's David Orter, um, the job is the wrong unit of analysis. The correct unit of analysis is the task, and lots of jobs have got lots of tasks in them. So the particular task of replying to the customer a rather obvious question um, was something which is now done by a machine. But here's the point, they went off, and this is, Alan, I think slightly to your point, all these people are now going off and doing something else. They're phoning customers up and they're doing marketing and all that kind of thing. So the, the locus of tasks has sort of changed. I think that's mm. point number one. And one more point, if I may, is um, it also touches on, there was an earlier question about the effect of AI in the Bank of England and all that. It also touches on what you sort of, sort of mean by AI. And to the extent that AI is training machines to read websites and all of that, like training machines to play chess, AI is incredibly good at that. So training the machine to read the company's website is a job that current AI can do, and that displaces that series of tasks, and then the tasks move on elsewhere, as I was saying. What I think we need to worry, not worry about, but um, get a bit of better, better analytical hold on, is the next generation of AI, which is machines which are going to learn how to do better things. And that's a sort of conceptually different task, I think, to just setting machines to have a rule, which is play the game of chess or read the website. Jonathan, thanks. Fascinating. Lots of food for thought there, I'm sure. Um, people in the audience will want to pick up on some of those points in a moment. Um, while we're on our whistle-stop tour of the big picture trends of the UK labour market, Catherine, can we come back up back to some of the labour supply and participation issues that you uh, touched on? I mean, we know that despite the bit of a tick up recently, labour participation in the UK especially has been uh, depressed in the post-COVID era. Could you talk us through that? What's, what's going on? What should, we, what should we make of it? So, um, you know, just in the context of the charts that I showed, I think what it really highlights is how unusual this is for the UK compared to the experience over the previous uh, decades. And maybe there is an issue there also about, you know, how, how much should we rely on, on this data, how accurate uh, it is, and maybe that's a point we can, we can come on to um, a little bit later in, in the session. I, I think there's a couple things. Um, first of all, the big story on labor supply is, is often around demographics. You know, and it's a very gloomy, it's almost like Malthusian on, on its head um, uh, type scenarios. Um, I, was, I was at a conference and someone had mentioned a, a presentation that uh, they had seen where it said, uh, you know, based on current projections, the last Italian was going to be born in 200 years from now. Um, so, you know, very uh, sort of depressing um, sort of, uh, you know, outlook uh, with regards to, to demographics. And, you know, to me, it just seems like there is a lot of untapped potential supply over and above uh, what we're seeing in demographics. We've talked about skills uh, being one of them, but also it's around this issue of labor participation. So I think it was... Um, uh, a speech that Janet Yellen gave um, quite a number of years ago where she had done a little back of the envelope calculation that said if you had female participation rates that were the same as men globally, you would basically be um, introducing another China to the global economy. And if you do a similar exercise for Italy, so I focus on Italy as, as part of my coverage, um, if you just assume that um, Italian female labor participation is the same as the EU average, um, you would actually have a workforce that's growing by several hundred thousand um, uh, people. And if it was at um, the highest uh, level in the EU, say Sweden, you're talking about millions of additional workers. So something that could potentially completely transform, at least, um, you know, say over the next five to 10 years, the trajectory of the size of the workforce in, in Italy. So 
I don't think demographics is destiny. And I think this theme is, is sort of similar to, to my previous answer that, you know, structural changes, these changes, innovation, uh, the fact that people can choose how many children uh, they would like to have, these are signs of human progress. The problem is if policy doesn't uh, keep pace with that. There is a role uh, for public policy. Um, there may be one here in the UK given the current uh, trends we're seeing in participation. But again, if we look at other countries, it seems like these policies can be very effective. In Japan, uh, you now have female labor participation rates that are higher than in the US. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and one of the biggest cohorts that contributed to the rise in participation coming out of COVID in the US, one of these big uh, you know, recurring themes of a very resilient US economy is coming from mothers of young children. And maybe that has something to do with the active labor market policies there. So I think the key thing is, is policy uh, supporting um, individuals to maximize their potential and contribute to the economy. Thanks, Catherine. And perhaps, Alan, I can come to you again on some of these labour supply issues, including uh, participation. What's, what's your take? Um, well, I think that, you know, yes, we should be working on increasing, you know, labour market participation. I mean, the big issue, I think, among working age people is basically those who are um, on some kind of sickness or inactivity for that reason. And that, you know, those numbers are sort of high. And I think we're kind of not really doing enough to address that. I mean, a lot of those people are around are, are suffering from mental health issues. I think we're just doing much too little as a society to address um, problems with mental health. Um, there may even be some negative externalities from some aspects of our society on people's mental health, work even possibly, uh, with work becoming kind of more stressful. So I think we need to focus on that. Then we are going to be facing with an ageing you know, society and there's nothing really that we can do about that. And so we have to get pe keep people working for longer, which we should be able to do because people hopefully are healthier for longer. Um, so I think those are the, I would see as the two big challenges. Thanks, Alan. And Jonathan, we're going to come on in our sort of next session to trace through what some of this means for the structural rate of unemployment and for wage dynamics. But on this sort of broader issue of labour supply, clearly something that's featured pretty heavily in monetary policy. Reports. Yeah, it has. And the monetary policy report, you know, details a lot of the discussions that, that, that we've been having. And, and so I agree with Alan um, and Catherine on, on this. Um, it's a big challenge. It's a rise in inactivity but also it's a rise in the proportion of the inactive who say basically they never want to work again. Um, so they're becoming more and more detached from the labour market. Um, and I'm very sympathetic, Alan, to you know, what you just said, which is the increase is, it, 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 when we think of health reasons, we traditionally think of you know, people have hurt their arm and hurt their leg, industrial accidents, a very manufacturing kind of centred centered view of health and so on. Um, but they're much more nuanced and they're much more difficult health problems now. I think we know this from the data um, around mental health and all those kind of challenges as well. Um, maybe that needs, not for me to say as a monetary policy maker, but maybe that needs a different policy environment on the health side. Okay. Well, thanks, Jonathan. And I'm just going to press pause on the panel discussion for a few minutes and come to the audience for uh, questions. Um, I'm going to ask, please, that if we can keep the questions for this uh, bit of the session to some of the sort of structural labour market issues on demand and supply, there'll be plenty of opportunities to get into wage growth and policy and indeed labour market data and its quality um, later. Um, but uh, for those who do want to raise, ask questions, please raise your hands, wait for the mic to come round and if you could identify yourself and if appropriate your organisation, that'd be great. I'll probably take three at a time. Yes, please, at the, uh, at the front there. Fantastic session. My name is Amlan Roy. I'm with LSE and LCP. Uh, and I've been working with governments on aging, so I, I feel very bad to have to speak to a labor expert. But why can't UK and rest of the European economies do what Japan, corporate Japan, is doing? Part-time, part-year, part-week. So Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, etc. they're coming back, and that keeps... Alzheimer's, dementia, all these things further off. Singapore, where government servants were retiring at 50 now, is retraining them and telling them, you're living nearly as long as the Japanese. 
let's do those kind of things. So retraining is one thing, and I totally agree with what she talked about female labor force participation, because in places like Japan and Italy and Germany, while there's been a narrowing, the gaps still are 9 to 12 percent between male and female labor force participation, despite women being better educated at college level. So they, these are what Abesan used to call structural arrows. So the third arrow needs to be practiced, I think, even in other countries. I'd like um, Alan and my dear friend Jonathan to, and Catherine to respond to that. Uh, great question. Thanks very much. I'm just going to collect up two more, I think, before, um, before I turn to the panel. Uh, perhaps at the back there, please. Thank you. Aza Zangana from uh, Schroders. Um, actually, a question probably mostly for Catherine, and that's looking at the different labour markets across Europe and comparing them with the experience in the US and the UK. The they haven't seemed to experience the same kind of missing workers problem, the fall off in participation, where we've had record high employment rates, even as unemployment rates have come down. That, that seems to strike me as quite a big difference in, in where those labor markets have ended up. Obviously, the differences in, in labor market policy as well. But maybe, if, if I can, a broader question for the panel, and that is, is there a risk that the ongoing use of short-term worker contracts, furlough schemes, and so on, could that eventually lead to a Japanification of the labor markets across Europe and maybe even the UK in driving down productivity rates? Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think I'll try to take one more, uh, perhaps at the back there on the right. Thank you. Reinhard Kluse from UBS. Uh, my question would be on AI. Uh, we all agree it's a big deal, uh, but could you be a bit more specific on timeframes? We heard from Jonathan, we should uh, distinguish between jobs and tasks. We heard um, also that, you know, 10 years ago there was big panic about robots and it hasn't, well, a lot has happened, but it's not been um, perhaps as dramatic as many people feared. So how will this now work uh, its way through the system. As a sell-side uh, economist, I get the question how AI will, will affect the ECB interest rate outlook for the next two and three years, and I really struggle to say this is relevant <laughs> in this time frame, but maybe there are other views. I'd be very curious what you think. Thank you. Okay, thanks. A great set of questions there to get, to get us going. Um, and perhaps we'll start with the first question, what, what perhaps we can learn from Japan. Adam, could I come to you on that? Um, well, the, here, here goes my reputation as the, the foremost <laughs> labour economist. Uh, um, um, because I, I, I don't know specifically about uh, Japan, I'm afraid. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the thing about retraining older workers is, is, is that it's really hard. If someone tried to retrain me now, they're, they're, they're going to really <laughs> Um You know, I think it's much more about keep all, people keeping people connected. I mean, once they've been disconnected, reconnecting them, I think, is really, really kind of hard. Um, you know, that, I don't really have anything more to say than that. And, and what, well, I've, well, we've got you, Alan. Perhaps we can just, you can just um, turn to this uh, last question on AI and timeframes. Yeah, my reputation is going to take another hit. There. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I have no idea. I'm very sceptical that any of this is going to happen terribly, terribly quickly. I mean, I think generally my view is that we've got a problem of low productivity growth, and probably that comes from having too slow an adoption of new technology in various forms rather than we've got a problem with how fast technological growth is. Thanks, Alan. Um, Jonathan, perhaps I can come to you with the same pair of questions, the uh, retraining older workers and some of the lessons from other parts of the world, and then also a uh, time frame for AI. Um, I, I, Alan is being too modest. Alan would be an excellent employee, <laughs> as a retrained employee anywhere. So let me just be absolutely clear about um, all of that. Um, Alan, I think you raised an interesting question about Japan. Um, again, if I can go back to personal anecdote, as I say, because I have the privilege of visiting lots of firms, firms are incredibly adaptable, actually. So if they see opportunities to act in that way, um, I think they would do so. Um, on the length of time that it will take, um, again, just to add a little bit of colour to Alan's answer, um, we, I think we know that technological revolutions, at least in terms of productivity, take an astonishingly long time. Right? So electricity, 
was available to lots of firms. I know the 1880s, 1890s, it took until the 1920s for that to show up. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of the robotics, uh, if that's your part of your AI, loads of that has been done. I mean, those routine tasks done by robots have just been automated um, away. The next generations of AI, as we were just discussing, will take longer to implement. That'll require complementary investments as well. So I think we're talking a long time for this to come through. Thanks, Jonathan. So uh, I'm thinking not the next interest rate decision from the Bank of England then. Couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Um, Catherine, can I come to you? And uh, if I could particularly ask you to pick up on the second question that we got with this sort of compare and contrast um, of different labour markets in different countries. Yeah, I think this is um, it's a great uh, question because it was something that I don't think people would have expected to have seen in the data. You know, we've already talked about, you know, the UK labour participation falling back. You know, this was very surprising uh, given that this has been, you know, such a bright spot for, for the UK economy for, for so long. And in the US, of course, in the early period, uh, you know, when uh, we were in the depths of the pandemic, people were really worried that um, we were going to see a repeat of what happened after the global financial crisis, which is where labor participation fell, inactivity rose, and it took you know, almost 10 years to get to a participation rate that was back at the level that it was in you know, whenever, to, to 2008. So the fact that Europe was showing a very different picture that actually labor participation was uh, not just recovering, but actually surging ahead. It was like, wow, who, who, who would have predicted that? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, perhaps it's a little bit of an ex post uh, rationalization, but, you know, the only thought that I, I have come up with, um, and I'd be interested to hear from others if, if they have different views, is, you know, Europe did put through some important reforms, especially around the labor market. You know, it differed across different countries uh, coming out of the global financial crisis after the sovereign debt crisis. And, and perhaps we could never see the benefit of those reforms because Europe effectively wasn't really growing uh, very much um, in, in, in those years uh, before the pandemic or growing very, very weakly. Um, but then, you know, with the fiscal support, with the monetary support and the covering of some of these European fault lines, we saw, you know, a very strong recovery in demand. And perhaps that was really where, you know, the benefit of these reforms actually was realized. And, and perhaps that is what underpins the more good news story that we're seeing, at least on the labor supply side. You know, you do have to scrounge around in Europe for, for good news when it comes to the macroeconomy. But that is uh, definitely one, one positive and, um, you know, long, long may it last. Thanks, Catherine. I think we're just going to press pause on the questions for a moment and return to the panel. And having started quite big and quite long term, we're going to make it a little bit more crunchy uh, and talk about the implications of some of these big structural trends for the uh, equilibrium unemployment rate and for wage dynamics. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to start us off about that. Oh, thanks, thanks very much. Let's, so, look, as, as people in the audience will know, the labour market has been a central focus of the MPC. And at the um, press conference yesterday, uh, the governor and uh, Ben Broadbent and uh, Dave Ramsden talked a lot about the labour market. In particular, talked about um, something which we're spending a lot of time on the MPC, namely the very high wage inflation we seem to see at the moment. Uh, and again, this is a well-informed audience, so you'll know that the average, um, uh, the AWE, the average um, wage index, um, average weekly earnings index is rising at about 8%. Other indices are rising at around 7%. Um, this is a very high rate of wage increase relative to what we've seen before. Um, now, let me be clear, if I may, just before I go yeah. on to other things, is increases in wages are a good thing. Right? We want people to be rewarded for the work that they're doing and that to be a just reward uh, and that to be something um, uh, uh, which compensates people uh, for the effort that they put in. So be very clear that we want uh, increases in wages. Um, but from an inflationary point of view, what we're interested on the committee is, are the increases in wages kind of unexpected? Are they more than we would otherwise have forecast uh, in the context of, for example, people's price expectations, in the context of the tightness of the labor market, uh, in the context of productivity? Uh, and in almost all of the models we've got, those wage increases are more than we can actually explain. 
Um, and that takes you to a couple of places. One place is something's gone wrong with the wage index and the Office of National Statistics is grappling with all of these difficulties and these challenges. Um, I think we're going to come on to that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So let's park that for the moment. Um, assuming that there is, as we assume there is some signal in the wage index, um, then I think it looks plausible that the natural rate, the structural rate of unemployment um, has gone up. That is to say, um, because of the impaired kind of matching that we've seen in the labour market, uh, if the labour market is less able to match unemployed workers uh, with the vacancies that are available, um, then uh, uh, um, the, the sort of underlying rate of unemployment, maybe that's a better word, um, uh, therefore goes up. And then that adds, obviously, to the wage pressure in the economy. Um, and if one goes down that route, that obviously has some implications for future monetary policy and so on. Um, and again, watchers here will know that we've raised our estimate <coughs> at the bank of the equilibrium unemployment rate. Um, uh, so we, we, we've tipped it up a little bit. Um, and that's the reason why we've done that. We've looked hard at the number of different indicators uh, of, the matching, uh, of the matching tendency uh, in the labor market. Um, most of them since the pandemic suggest that matching has got worse. Um, it's true that on some estimates, that matching propensity has come back, back a little bit. In other words, it, it's got less worse, um, but it still is worse than it is before the pandemic. Um, and so that's, um, I hope, a little bit of colour uh, as to how it is we're thinking about this important issue uh, and why we've raised our estimate of the underlying rate. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. That was great, really interesting. I'm sure lots of things to pick up on. Um, Catherine, perhaps I can just come to you next on this question of wage dynamics and the feed through to inflation, potentially. Well, I think, you know, at 40,000 feet, these different trends that we've seen on labor participation do look to be reflected also that in the differences that we're seeing in wage growth across these regions. So, um, you know, the UK has seen uh, what looks like a, a bigger decline in, in labor supply and it has a higher wage growth in, in Europe. Um, labor supply looks like it's, it's held up much better and, and wage growth there looks uh, much, more, much more muted with the US sort of a little bit in, in between the, those two cases. So at a very high level, it, it strikes me that that um, sort of ranking that you would expect to see from the supply side is, is reflected in um, an, indicator of labor market tightness uh, coming coming from wage growth. Um, and then that in turn is also reflected in the ranking that you see on services price inflation, where again, the UK does have significantly higher services price inflation um, than we're seeing in, in these other regions where labor supply looks looks to have held up. And you know, we'll come on to talk about um, you know, what this all means for monetary policy, but it, it strikes me that, um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of central bank decision making right now is, you know, a lot of relief that headline has come off, even more relief to see uh, some beginnings of a sign, at least here in Europe, um, I include UK and, and Europe, um, and uh, that, that core inflation is, is coming off. But it strikes me that uh, for policymakers to feel really comfortable and confident to start contemplating cuts, they're going to want to see in the remainder of this year that core inflation continues to fall back and that the beginning of next year, because that is an important period for wage agreements um, in the euro area as well as the UK, that that too is showing signs of easing. Um, but you know, it strikes me if I listen to policymakers, they will want to see that baked into the data before they uh, move to the next kind of logical step, which is perhaps thinking, you know, where, where do rates need to be? And you know, maybe maybe we're not quite there yet. Thanks, Catherine. And Adam, perhaps if I can turn to you before we go back to the audience. So if we think about the kind of recent history of the UK labour market, we had a long period where we kept the structural unemployment rate, the equilibrium unemployment rate, kept falling. It now seems to be turning a corner. We've just heard Jonathan talk a bit about this sort of inching up of the Bank of England's estimates. What's your sense of what's, what's going on? Um, I mean, I think I would be more cautious about saying the natural rate of unemployment has, has gone up. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, we're coming out of the pandemic, which was really a very unusual kind of period. It's quite hard to read exactly what's going on. 
Um, there are issues um, around sort of, you know, data issues as, as well and things. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it's going to... I think there's very good reason to think that nominal wage growth is not consistent with the inflation target at the moment, and so, so is going to have have to come down. And that we think means that the labour markets have, um, you know, we've got to have more slack in the labour market. But it's how you measure slack is the thing. Is that just the unemployment rate? Is it the UV ratio? And if it's the UV ratio, are we going to have the UV ratio going up by the unemployment rate going up? or the vacancy rates falling. And actually, vacancy rates are falling like a stone at the moment and um, without very much change in, in unemployment. And I think I've seen too many times over my rather lengthy career people sort of over-interpreting short-run shifts in the beverage curve as representing something very deep and structural when it's actually some poorly understood dynamics. Thanks, Alan. So lots of food for thought there. I'm going to come um, out to the audience for a couple of questions on these sort of uh, wage dynamics on structural unemployment, um, and then we'll come back and talk about policy. Charlie. Uh, hi, Charlie Bean, uh, LSE these days. Um, I have some sympathy with the idea that the equilibrium unemployment rate may have risen, um, but partly picking up on uh, Alan's suggestion, um, I'd be a bit more skeptical that it's necessarily down to impaired matching. Uh, now, I'm old enough to have been around in the previous inflation burst uh, and the subsequent rise in unemployment. An important driver of what was going on then was what we used to call real wage resistance, and these days is called catch-up. But basically, workers responding to the deterioration in their uh, real pay because of the uh, the energy and food price shock by pushing for compensating pay increases. Um, now, uh, this is directed to Jonathan. Uh, why do you think it's matching rather than this more traditional channel, which my perception is that most central banks have forgotten about? Um, but as I say, the, the evidence back in the past was it's an important feature. And I think if I may, I might just, uh, we'll collect some more questions in a minute, but perhaps, Jonathan, we can come to that question now. Really, you know, really interesting. No, it's a good, it's a good challenge. And, and, and so, so two things, if I may. Um, Alan, you're, you're absolutely right. I don't want to be in the business of over-interpreting these shifts in the UV curves. But equally, we've got to make decisions, you know, every, every few weeks. And what we don't want is we don't want to wait until we've got a good fix on the UV curve and inflation be embedded. Um, so you're, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what you say. Um, I'm just trying to balance out the different risks on either side. Uh, and my view uh, is, is um, I'd rather push for an increase. I voted for an increase last time um, because of that risk. That's one thing. Um, Charlie, I'm also sympathetic with what you say as well. I think there is some evidence that the beverage curve, as I said, the matching has got worse. So I think there's evidence on the ground about the matching. Um, I, didn't, I think catch-up is an element as well, actually. Um, but given the short period of time, I didn't want to talk so much about catch-up. Um, but I think that's an element as well, which, which we factored into our calculations in a slightly different kind of way. Thank you. All right. Oh, lots of questions. So George at the front uh, first, please, and then I'll come take some from around the room. Hi, George Buckley from Nomura. Um, can I ask, uh, this is a question largely uh, for, for Jonathan, to what extent is the rise in the equilibrium unemployment rate simply the fact that you couldn't find anything else to explain the rise in wages versus some fundamental view that the uh, medium-term equilibrium unemployment rate has risen? Okay. Thanks. I've got a collective, uh, collective a few. Uh, over there, please. Hi. Yeah, on the, the discussion about wages, I think we have to be very careful whether we're trying to explain why wages are strong or whether why wages are stronger, for example, than in the U.S. Because this business about reduced matching, the U.S. has that in spades even worse than us. 
and, and the beverage curve shifting. And also the catch-up wage, actually the level of real wages in the UK relative to the US is about the same relative to pre-pandemic. And so there isn't more catch-up to be done. In fact, given that the trend was probably higher in the US, the, the, the shortfall is probably also higher in the US. And so just think, you know, these explanations for, what, you know, push you in the direction of what wage growth is high, but doesn't it, don't explain why it's higher in the UK than elsewhere. Thanks. I would say one more before I come back to the paddle pups over there at the back, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, Phil Aldrich at Bloomberg. Uh, Jonathan, in some remarks published today at the Bank of England of yours, um, you say that the um, uh, natural rate of unemployment could be as high as 6%. Um, if it is 6%, what would that mean? for interest rates, because the current forecasts for the Bank of England show peak at 5.1, peak unemployment at 5.1. Thank you. So, Jonathan, a couple of questions for you there, so perhaps we can start with that. But then, uh, Catherine, I might ask you to uh, come in and talk about some of the interna international dimension as well. That would be great. Jonathan. Well, thanks. And, and I'll, try, I'll try to be brief. I won't do justice to the good questions, but I don't want to crowd out other people on no, the panel. Um, so thanks for the question. Um, so, so George, yeah, it's true as a diagnosis. We're looking at um, what can and cannot be explained by our conventional suite of wage equations and other equations with a VU ratio in them and so forth as well. But we're also looking at complementary evidence for things like matching the shift of the beverage curve, things like catch up and all that kind of thing as well. So we're trying to look at all the evidence um, in the round. Um, uh, Jan, th you know, th thanks for your nice question on catch up. I think it depends upon how you define catch up. Right, so Bernanke Blanchard and their model, for example, define catch up as the inflation rate relative to what it was that people expected, in which case we'd have much more to go um, here relative to the US. Um, but I'd have to think about what, what, that, what the implications are in, in, in the discussion you were saying about the various levels and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to think about all of that. Um, I couldn't see, is it Phil who's asking the question? I've got a light shining in, in my eyes. Um, uh, look, this estimate of 6% is very much, uh, on you, Star, is very much an upper bound uh, estimate. That's if nothing else changed uh, in the labour market on the basis of, you know, the suite of wage equations um, that, that we have got. So um, do I believe that the equilibrium rate is 6%? Um, no, I don't. Like I said, that's a complete upper bound. But is that a reason that rates will be higher uh, for longer than otherwise be the case? Um, yes, it is. Okay, thanks. And Catherine? So I think very simplistically, uh, the way I've, I've tried to understand why does the inflation problem in the UK seem so much more acute uh, relative to the US or the Euro area is it sort of strikes me that the UK was buffeted by both of those shocks. So in, in the US, we've primarily had very strong demand uh, driving inflation. Um, whereas in the euro area, it's primarily been driven by energy prices. The UK had both of those. And moreover, the energy shock in the UK was even marginally bigger than it was in the euro area. So th that, to me, um, at a very high level, sort of explains, if you like, why um, the issue seems, seems more acute here. This question on real wage resistance, I think, is, is a really um, interesting one. Um, and, and you know why why that's gone up, and it, it reminds me a lot of the discussion that we had maybe about ten years ago on exchange rate pass through. You know, all the literature my my advisor had done um, written papers on uh, local currency pricing, producer currency pricing was all about you know trying to explain why don't you see you know PPP holding in in the data. And all the empirical studies were showing, you know, there's very little exchange rate pass through. And so, you know, we're a small open economy here in the UK. The exchange rate moved by a bit more than it normally would have done. And if you just looked at that literature, it would suggest, you know, we don't really need to worry about it in terms of the impact on headline inflation. And that turned out to be quite wrong. Um, so I think the message is, you know, maybe if the shocks are small, um, then these sorts of things don't get passed through very much. But if the shock is large, if it's persistent, then um, you know, using kind of rule of thumb on backward-looking data where the world of the past looked very different to the future is, is going to you know, mis mislead you, mis misguide you in terms of where, where things are heading. 
and the shock here was, was, was big. And I think it probably was not a good assumption to assume that um, you know, wages wouldn't shift at all to reflect the size of, of the price level shock that, that we all experienced, and some more acutely than, than others. Thanks, and I'm going to um, come back for a very quick uh, second round of questions in a moment. But Alan, this uh, question about real wage resistance, what we can or maybe cannot learn from the past, um, do you help us through it a bit? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I just sort of like to sort of amplify really what, what Catherine said. So when, you know, when inflation is 2% and um, employers don't really cut your nominal wages very often, the worst that can happen to you is your real wages fall by 2%. Suddenly, when inflation is 10%, that is a completely different world for most people, and that will make people really want to do something about it, whether that's to push for higher wages within their own firm or whether it's to seek out better, better wage opportunities um, elsewhere. So I think that is actually really very powerful, um, you know, force behind this. How much we can learn from the past? I mean, I think as many, many people in the labour market, this will be their first experience of something like this happening. So, you know, they can't learn from how this was dealt with in the past. They're sort of doing it for the first time. Um, so, you know, but I'm sort of sympathetic to the view that basically the pressures for higher wage increases are going to fall if we have nominal wage growth above, uh, above price inflation. Um, and I think, I think that's quite a plausible scenario. Thanks, Alan. And I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions on this bit before we come back and talk about policy. I'm going to take one at the front there and then Lady over there. Thank you. Uh, George, George Moran, Namora. Um, you mentioned that the Bank of England thinks pay growth is too high at the moment. Where do you think pay growth needs to be to be compatible with 2%? You may not be able to say exactly where you think it is, but do you think that may have changed post-pandemic? Do you think maybe we can, the Bank of England can tolerate a little bit higher pay growth than they could before the pandemic, or maybe it needs to be even lower than it had to be before the pandemic? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bruno Skarka, Morgan Stanley. Um, it's a question for Jonathan, actually. Um, I seem to remember that in uh, 2020, going out of the pandemic, you very often quoted um, the SAHIN index of uh, skills mismatches, looking at vacancies and uh, the sector at which un unemployed people worked. And I believe at the moment it does look fairly close to where it was in 4Q19, indicating that there's no skill skills mismatches at the moment. I was just wondering if you think that the data might be wrong or if there's any mismatches on a micro level that perhaps is working to push up Nairo higher in line with, with your thinking. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one more on this uh, section uh, down there, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Maria Rita Circi, Bank of Italy. Before our, our extension in uh, 200 years uh, uh, as Italian, even if we, we are still this period, I'd like to make um, a, a much quicker um, uh, question about, uh, in your view and according to your data, um, how and how much uh, uh, Brexit affected the UK labor market in general and wages in particular? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, let's let's start perhaps with uh, with Brexit and the labour market. Alan. Um, well, I I mean I'll, I'll just talk about maybe this the intention to talk about Brexit and and migration. So, obviously, Brexit led to a big change in the UK's uh, migration regime. Um, on paper, it sort of led to a radical sort of shift in the skill mix of immigration, so away from lower skilled um, migration, which EU migration, mostly from Eastern Europe, had ended up being, uh, towards more skilled um, migrants from elsewhere in the world. But in practice, um, I think it's turned out rather different from that. I think a big mistake in thinking about um, migration and the labour market is to think, just look at work visas when people are thinking about what is happening to, to employment. Whereas actually there's been, um, a, you know, lower skill 
workers are coming through other, other visas. And I think the best example of this is, I think that's fairly clear that there was a fall in e employment of um, people from the EU in hospitality, um, sort of after the pandemic, during the pandemic. There has been a much more than 100% compensation of increase in employment from non-EU workers in that sector, so that we're now higher than we were previously. Um, and, you know, how is that possible? Because hospitality doesn't have access to, to work visas for the most part. Well, it's almost certainly its students, its dependence on people on work visas, its dependence of students. Um, it's maybe um, some humanitarian routes, Ukraine and um, Ukraine, Hong Kong. So I think there's actually been much less change um, on the labour market side. I think the trade side of things is much more substantial, actually. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Um, Catherine, perhaps I can come to you on this question of pay growth and what's, uh, what is and what isn't compatible with the inflation target. How much has that, how much has that changed? I'm not going to give you a very exciting answer. Um, <clears throat> I think it's going to come down to thinking about where, where do you think inflation is going to be in the medium term, where do you think labor productivity is in the medium term, and then adding those two together to give an indication of um, where, where you would expect to be if all shocks have worked themselves out uh, through, through the system. Um, you know, it's clearly not 7% um, or 8% uh, and not even within striking distance of that. So, um, you know, this is what uh, led me to say earlier that it, it strikes me that policymakers are going to want to see wage growth easing uh, before they have a degree of confidence to um, contemplate even cutting rates. But it's some way... Uh, lower than where they are now for the UK. Uh, for Europe, um, I don't think we ever really saw much evidence of second round effects in nominal wage growth. Um, one of the really interesting things is that those economies in Europe that actually have been growing fastest had you know, relatively lower wage growth. So Italy, uh, up until recently, was um, you know, growing uh, much, much better than many people had expected. Spain was growing, and yet uh, there weren't really signs that uh, wages were looking out of line with um, what you might consider to be the ECB's you know, 2% inflation target. Thanks. And uh, Jonathan, I didn't know whether you wanted to build on those points from Catherine, but also we had a specific question, the second question of that batch uh, directed to you about uh, unemployment vacancies. Um, there was a question, I think, if I understood it correctly, on industrial mismatch and all those various indices. Um, there are lots of these indices flying around. Most of them went up enormously, as you'll know, in the pandemic. Many of them have come down. Um, some are a little bit higher, some are a little bit lower. There's the overall position of the VU curve, there's the catch-up effect and all of that. Um, so is any, is any one index, you know, not all the indices are all pointing in the same direction. Um, but I think there's evidence from um, a range of different, in, different indices which are pointing in that way. Um, on the feasible wage growth, um, the answer is, I'm, I'm afraid it's the same economist's answer that the, all the other panels have been given, which is it depends. Uh, it depends on productivity growth. It depends upon the balance of wages, rewards to wages versus rewards to capital. And it depends upon the terms of trade. And we've had, um, Silvana was saying this earlier on, we've had a terrible adverse terms of trade shock uh, in the UK, other economies. It's been rather different. Um, but given that, and the feasible amount of wage growth, uh, that then, that then that equation becomes very different as well. So it, it depends upon all those various other factors too. Thanks. So we're going to uh, come back to the panellists for our sort of final uh, little session, whereas we're going to try and uh, put the, some of these uh, pieces of the jigsaw together and talk about what sort of signals uh, we might take from the UK labour market for monetary policy. I think before we get to that, there's a very big question about how confident we are in taking any signals from UK labour market data at the moment, given, not least given the sort of widespread concerns that have been about some of the indicators. Uh, Alan, did you want to start us off? Um, yes, no, I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, I think there's, I, I've sort of concerns really about the quality of some of the data that we're sort of basing, you know, these very important decisions on. Obviously, the thing that sort of 
you know, attracted the most attention recently as being, you know, the LFS and the ONS basically not publishing um, it last, uh, last month. Um, but the weaknesses in the LFS have been really, you know, they've been around for kind of a long time. And um, I have been worried for quite a long time about how much people have just been reporting labour force statistics. Um, statistics without really any indication to someone outside that we, we, we should be, there's sort of health warnings attached to them. Um, now, you know, the ONS has currently got the transformed LFS out in the field. I, I think they'll be looking, they'll be seeing results from that internally. My guess, this is just reading between the lines, is that they would not have cancelled the LFS publication if the results looked similar to the transformed LFS. Um, so I, my guess is they're different, but I've no idea in which way they're different, which isn't another dent to my reputation. Um, but I think more than that, I sort of also worry about some of the quality of these, uh, these earnings statistics. Like, I mean, Jonathan mentioned early average weekly earnings. This comes from the monthly wage and salary schedule. I'm particularly scarred by this because I applied to the SR3, as it was then, for a sort of research grant to analyse the micro data. Uh, that li underlies this survey and uh, basically got lots of money and very excited to open up the data and within half an hour realised that at the micro level it's really totally unusable for research purposes. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's got very serious, serious problems um, at the aggregate level. Um, but it does make me worry and in particular it's sort of got a huge amount of volatility um, at the individual um, level. It doesn't adjust for composition of changes. It doesn't adjust for hours changes. It doesn't, to me, look like, you know, what you would like as a really good measure of, um, of you know, labour market pressures, which would be, you know, compare it, say, to the US employment cost. I could go on, but perhaps I'll stop there for the moment. I'm just going to ask you one little follow-up on that, Alan. So if we can't, um, if we're worried about the Labour Force Survey, if we're worried about average weekly earnings, what are we a bit less worried about? What about something like the ASH data? Is there anything that you... No, I'm afraid about? ASH... I mean, OK, you want, you've invited me to go on. <laughs> I did try to stop you. Um, so ASH, the, as, as far as I can tell, the response rate has collapsed on that, even though that is a, you know, it's a legal obligation on employers to, um, to um, you know, reply to that. Um, if we go to, say, the RTI, POYE data, I think that's interesting. It's still sort of fairly experimental. What I feel there is that people should be pushing to look at that on an individual basis. It's like, basically, it's a much bigger, better ash, basically. Um, and nobody has been really pushing, pushing on that. So I think there's a sort of irony that because more and more information is digitised, information data broadly interpreted, that in some sense we should be doing better and better, and yet we seem to end up doing worse and worse. Thanks, Alan. And Jonathan, as a policymaker, what do you, what do, you do in this circumstance? What... Um, look, I, I agree with quite a lot of what Alan said, and, and, and Alan, I know when you were on the Migration Advisory Committee, you were very concerned about the quality of the data as well, and a lot of what you read, a lot of what you wrote, you know, called out the data uh, uh, and tried to get the ONS to do a better job. And I'm very sympathetic with all of that. Um, I do want to say something about the monthly wage and salaries survey. Uh, it has got an over 80% response rate. Um, now, if you look at all the micro data and all of that, I appreciate there's some mm. volatility, but of course it's not designed to be a longitudinal data set of individual firms. Um, and certainly an over 80% response rate is very different <laughs> to the travails of the Labour Force survey. So I just want everybody in the room to understand that, that is a different survey to the Labour Force su survey data. I, 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 think, I think it's worth um, sort of stressing all of that. Um, the other thing is the ONS have as pu published yesterday, as you'll have seen, an action plan uh, for, what to deal, for how to deal with all of this. Um, but in the end, well, it comes down, I think, to two things. One thing is the internal workings of any statistical agency, grappling with waiting, response rates, getting people to answer the phone and all that kind of thing. That's one issue. And a second issue, which was in Charlie Bean's report, Charlie Bean is sitting down here, which is the extent to which statistical agencies can access data from other agencies in government, such as tax data and all of that. Um, and there's been perhaps not as much progress on that. Um, as there might have been. 
Thank you, Jonathan. And um, before we open it up to questions, Catherine, perhaps I can come to you, uh, not perhaps just on this um, really, really important issue of data quality, but just more broadly on the signals um, from the labour market for uh, policymakers. Well, if I just think about, um, you know, what are the consequences of this? It strikes me that they're potentially pretty big. Um, one thing I think um, another member of the MPC, Ben Broadbent, has talked about recently, but also um, early on when he joined the MPC, is if you're in a world where you think there is a high degree of uncertainty around the supply side of the economy, your other things equal going to be more reliant on labor market data. And, you know, we started off this panel by talking about, um, you know, issues around labor supply. Uh, so, you know, just at this very time, you can imagine that the need to have really accurate labor market data is perhaps higher than it would normally be. So the fact that um, it's maybe not giving, you know, all the right steers is, is an issue. And, you know, just moving beyond the UK and moving beyond labor market data, you're, you're seeing a lot of variation and revisions in you know, very important macro data for policymakers. We had a big revision to the level of GDP uh, in the UK you know, just a couple months ago. You're seeing these big revisions elsewhere. And I mean, it seems like a very obvious statement to make, but you know, it's really hard to set policy optimally if you don't have the correct data. And there was a great paper that was written uh, quite some time uh, now ago by um, Athanasios Orfanidis, who talked a lot about, you know, trying to understand this issue. You know, why was it that policymakers seemingly made a mistake, you know, in the in in the past um, in taming inflation? And his conclusion was, well, a lot of the real time data that they had was was wrong. Um, and you know, maybe there's an element of that uh, at play here. And it strikes me that would be a great. Um, you know, PhD thesis or something for someone to do, um, not not for me, but maybe somebody <laughs> somebody else. Uh, but it's it's very problematic uh, from a policymaker's perspective. I would have thought to have um, data that's being revised so much, uh, you know, almost uh, in in real time. Thanks, Catherine. And um, I'm going to open it back up really for the final time today. Please feel free to ask on labour market, on policy, more more broadly. Perhaps I'm going to collect some threes. Perhaps we'll start down at the front with uh, Chris. Chris Jowles from the Financial Times. Um, one of the uh, key uh, bits of data that the Bank of England has been using for taking quite a hawkish stance, apart from just what's happened to inflation, has been the sense that we are, as a country, an outlier in having a worse participation recovery uh, from, the, from COVID than any other country. Does the panel think that actually has happened? Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to collect up a couple, um, but a great question. Um, lady there, please. Uh, Sonali Panhani from UBS. Uh, my question is that given the participation decline that we've seen in the UK, is bank rate the right tool uh, to actually bring wage growth down, given some of the reasons for the decline in labor participation is quite structural, and maybe the government has a role to play in order to bring it down rather than the Bank of England worrying about uh, that too much. Uh, and the second question is, uh, how confident is the bank that we can get wage growth down uh, with such a benign uh, rise in unemployment that they have in their forecasts and and I know that they downgraded growth yesterday and we have pretty low growth but we are not forecasting a recession in the UK so how confident uh, is the bank that we can get through this uh, without a recession and actually get inflation uh, closer to target thank you and I think we've got a question Martin at the end there Martin wheel could I ask a question on the wages data please how statistically different do you think it's eight percent is from seven percent in other words, are the differences actually taking account of the standard errors material or not? Great. Thank you. Right. Well, some great questions. Um, where should we go first? Um, Alan, do you want to talk to us about uh, participation rates, UK, euro error and data? I'm really picking up on Chris's, uh, Chris's great question. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to say I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm not really... 
a Bank of England watcher. I'm more of a sort of an occasional sideways glance kind of person. <laughs> um, so I, I'm afraid I haven't been crawling all over this. But I have been concerned that people have simply been reporting the LFS figures as, you know, un in undisputed fact for quite a long time when they should have been, you know, there should have been alarm bells going off a long time a long time ago. I think the admin, the claims data on inactivity and sickness, I think they have gone up. Am I right about that? I th yeah. Um, and so on. I, I think, uh, could I just say something on Martin's yeah. point about response rate? I mean, a low response rate doesn't really matter if you've got a random, um, you know, if it's a random sample. I think the, is, the, the concern is around differential response rates and, you know, the potential for differential response rates to cause you problems. Um, if you've got a response rate that's 95%, it just limits how much can go wrong. Whereas when it's 10%, an awful lot can go wrong. So I think it's that. And I've always been slightly nervous about how rudimentary in the LFS has been the model of response rates, essentially, that they've used um, explicitly or implicitly. Thank you. Um, Catherine, perhaps I'll come to, come to you next uh, on this question about... Uh, international comparisons and, um, and more broadly on wage growth and monetary policy? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim I'm, I'm a great expert on, on the UK uh, labour market data either. Um, I, I have read uh, that there is some evidence to challenge uh, that a large part of the decline in labour participation is because of this long-term sick, but I'm not, I'm not close to that. Um, you know, so, so there may be a bit of a mismeasurement issue there, but, you know, very high level, uh, the fact that the supply side looks to have deteriorated in the UK relative, say, to the US or the Euro area does fit with what we're seeing in terms of differentials in, in, mm. in wages. So it's not obvious that we should just, um, you know, dismiss it out of hand. So I think for now, we, we have to rely on the evidence that we do have and, um, you know, uh, m maybe look at a range of other indicators as, as well. And on the question about is bank rate the right tool to squeeze wage growth down? This is a really difficult question. I mean, from, from, from the MPC's perspective, they have a remit. They need to get inflation um, back to the 2% target. Um, that's their delegated responsibility from, from the government, and, and they're going to remain focused on that. And to the degree that there are structural inadequacies um, that are hampering or hindering that process, you know, that is for, um, you know, elected authorities uh, to do. And I'm not, I'm not sure that the role of, of any independent central bank should be to somehow, you know, try to compensate for... Uh, perceived lack of um, government action elsewhere. They just need to be focused on their, their mandate and do their best to deliver on that and explain in situations like we're in today, you know, why, why inflation is not at 2% and how long they think it's going to take to get there. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not... Um, it's, it's not a great answer, but I think that is the sort of the world, uh, at least as I understand, you know, the, the separation of, of um, powers to, to, to be. And then, uh, Jonathan, I, is there anything that you would add on, you know, it was a really great range of questions. Yeah, and so let me take up um, get Catherine's answer to, I, th I think it was your, your question, if I could see the person answering the, asking the question. Um, look, it, is the Bank of England responsible for, you know, a rise in ill health and, you know, loss of confidence and, you know, all that, which, which, which comes with all that sort of stuff. Well, it was a bit like the discussion we had earlier on climate and all those kinds of things. We kind of have the Bank of England responsible for absolutely everything. And so, um, again, uh, it's not the Bank of England's responsibility to act on that particular dimension, but imaginative ideas around improving a lot of, you know, all of our fellow citizens are surely, you know, are surely, surely what we want, even if they're not in the Bank of England's um, um, uh, remit. Um, in terms of what is in our remit, that is to get inflation down to 2%, and that's what we shall do. Um, going to Martin Wheel's question, I know, Martin, you've worked, uh, and I should commend Martin's work extensively, 
on the wages and so forth. Um, yeah, 8%, 7%, I mean, all of these um, wage uh, indices are all pretty high. Um, there were quite big sampling errors around them. I can't remember exactly what the sampling error is in the average word. Is it 0.1 or 0.5? I'm looking at my, my fellow officials in the front, in the yeah. front row, in the front row here. Um, so, you know, they're all close to each other, but they're all goes back to the earlier question. Um, they're all too high uh, in terms of um, fe feasible wages. Um, and, and then uh, um, Chris Giles asked whether participation really has not recovered. Um, it looks very different in the UK, as people will know, to other countries. Um, I find it hard to believe that it's just purely a statistical artifact because of the inaccuracies, given echoing what Alan was saying. We've got other measures of sickness and so forth. We know waiting lists have gone up by a lot. So we've got a lot of correlates, it seems to me, of the rise in inactivity. Thanks, and I think we've probably got time for one or two more before we close. Um, at, the, uh, at the back there, I'll take one from that side as well, and over there, please. Thank you, Marco Stringer. Element Capital. Uh, one question of linking the communication challenge that Rob um, uh, highlighted before, policy and wages. So you have um, a mode forecast and a mean forecast. Your policy now is based on the mean. That is what drives the policy stance. We know your wages, which are behind the mode forecast, but we don't know anything about how you come to that skew. And that skew is large. Let's say 75, 100 base point of your policy stance. Um, we thought that that was capturing the labor market, potentially higher narrow. You increase the narrow, but the skew has not changed. So that is one question. It, how do you come to that skew? And the second question is, are you worried that analysts keep focusing on your mod forecast for wages, which is not backing up the mod forecast, so in a way is weaker than what you really think? But you don't show us the mean wage forecast, so what we have is the mod forecast. So to me that is if I may, a communication error that makes you feel, makes you seem more dovish than you are. So maybe that should be tried to be fixed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question over there. Thank you. Uh, David Millican from Reuters here. Um, uh, so really a question for sort of Jonathan, but also interested in other people's sort of views on this. Um, sort of just to press you a little bit more on where you see the equilibrium unemployment rate, as you sort of clarify that sort of that six percent is very much an upper limit. But what would you say you think your central estimate would be for that, and whether you think unemployment's likely to have to rise above the five percent? I think which the Bank of England sort of forecasts for inflation to come back down to target. Thank you. And I think I'm just going to take one more. I've uh, been very patient there in the middle. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is probably another question for Jonathan. <laughs> um, very popular. No, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, now, if you read uh, the bank's monetary policy summary, it sort of gives the impression that um, you know, we've been discussing all these labor market statistics, but the AWE is probably still a pretty high quality statistic, but the monetary policy summary gives the impression that the committee is putting less emphasis on that and on other and more emphasis on other wage surveys instead. And I wonder was there was any evidence to suggest that these other wage service surveys are better indicators of future inflation than the AWE or or why the committee chose to do that? Because at the end of the day there is no evidence of peak in AWE. Those other ones seem to have peaked, so um, I guess those are my questions around that. Thank you. Thanks. So I think um, I think I've got to come to you first, uh, Jonathan. I made some comments there about interpreting the forecast about uh, unemployment rate and other. Yeah. Again. So, so thank you for the excellent questions, and, and I, I shall to try to be brief because you know other panelists I'm sure want to come in. Um, so on the question about the mean and the mode and the skew and all of that, um, the skew captures lots of different things besides the risk of the wage forecast and so on. So we don't attach particular skews to particular individual bits of the whole forecast. Um, so if that's to obscure that, I'm afraid, is uh, well, you know, one of the issues around the skew, um, which, as I say, is designed to capture um, a whole load of other risks. Um, 
on um, the question about what U star is. Um, so as I say, I think 6% is an upper estimate. If you had to push me, I think it's probably a bit higher than the bank's central estimate of 4.5%. Um, whether it's going to have to rise or go down, that depends upon all the various other things which happen. It depends upon whether the beverage curve comes back in again, the extent of catch up, which other speakers have raised and so forth. Um, so that, that, that's kind of hard to say. Um, lastly, on the issue about the emphasis on the AWE, um, I, I'm, I mean, We've looked very closely at the AWE for all the reasons that Alan Manning has pointed out. We've looked closely at these other indicators as well. Um, we believe that the AWE is giving you know, a, a, an important read, as I say, the high response rate, which I said earlier on. If that impression doesn't come out in the minutes, then I'm, I'm sorry that's the impression that we've given, um, but it's very important. And uh, as I say, it fits into the general theme that this wage inflation measure is very important indeed. Sorry to go on for... No, no not, not at all. That, that was great. Um, uh, and Catherine, perhaps I can just come to you about these questions about uh, communication, about the fan, about the forecast. I mean, from your perspective as a, as a commentator and an, and an analyst of these things, where, where do you stand? So, um, I mean, uh, one, one thing that I'll be looking out for when uh, Bernanke uh, concludes his review is what, what recommendations he has mm. around central bank communications, because um, it's very easy to identify the problem. It's, it's a whole heck of a lot harder to come up with, with solutions. And, you know, we've had this debate uh, really rumbling along for more than 10 years around changing the inflation target. Um, and we, we had the discussion today and, you know, my, my conclusion from what we heard from a previous panel is it's just a very difficult thing to do at any given point in time. So, uh, you know, what potentially needs to change about this framework? Well, if we think we're in a world where the frequency and the size of shocks is going to be greater than what we observed over the past, then, you know, in theory, the flexible inflation target regime is going to tell you, well, then you just take longer to get back to target. But policymakers are sort of messaging something quite different, especially in Europe, where um, governing council members have been really emphasizing the importance of getting inflation uh, back to the target as soon, you know, as, as, as possible. But if you follow the theory that inflation is going to deviate from target for a very long time, you know, how do you explain that? It puts a huge premium on central bank communications. How can you convince um, everybody that you do have a target if you're not at the target year after year after year? It's, that's a very difficult thing to do. So um, I'm afraid, um, you know, it's, it's easy for me to point out the the, the challenges, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any, any easy answers, but maybe Bernanke um, can help us a little bit there. I'm, I'm full of hope. So, and on that optimistic note, um, I think what I'm going to do is um, just come to our panellists and really um, ask you if you wanted the audience to take away one thing from what we've talked about over the last hour and a half, what would it be? And perhaps, Alan, I'll come to you first, then Catherine. And then Jonathan for a final word. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I just don't, I think it's very hard to know what's going on. I, I don't find any of the reasons given for why the Nero has gone up hugely convincing. I think, you know, there's a question about how much of a period of sort of disequilibrium, i.e. unemployment above the Nero, you need to get back to, to equilibrium. Um, but, you know, I'm uncertain. I'm, I just... I, I find, feel uncomfortable with this argument that the narrow has gone up. Thank you, Alan. Catherine. Uh, for me, it would be, you know, the past is not a good guide to the future. Um, extrapolating past trends forward can, I think, of, often lead you to sort of absurd uh, results. And uh, a belief in human adaptability and uh, that good policy can, um, you know, change, change, uh, help, help ease the uh, structural changes in ways that really make the life of the policymaker much easier. Okay, thanks, Catherine. And Jonathan? Um, I, look, we have to take, you know, decisions every six weeks. Um, I would love it if the Nehru hadn't gone up, uh, but I'm concerned that it has. We've got some evidence to indicate that. Um, and if we don't act on that, then I worry that inflation would get embedded. Um, so that's the reason why um, I think we should be acting upon that basis. 
Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I think that really just leads me to thank uh, David Aitman and the team at uh, King's uh, Business School and our event uh, co-organisers, co the Qatar Centre of Global Banking and Finance uh, and the Macro Money and Finance Society. Um, I'd really like to thank the audience. That was just such a fantastic set of questions from a real interesting, diverse range of people. And I think we could have probably kept going for hours. Uh, and of course, massive thank you to our panellists, uh, to Alan Manning, Catherine Nice, uh, Jonathan Haskell. Thank you very much. Well, let, let me thank Leo and the, the panel for a great session. And I think um, we can all say that we've had a really uh, worthwhile Bank Watchers Conference. Uh, this is the second time we've run this Bank Watchers Conference, and I'm beginning to wonder how we managed without it. Um, Last year, we had a, uh, to turn away about twice as many people as we had capacity for. Uh, this year, I think there was something like uh, 650 registrations from bank watchers and even a few sideways glancers who came along as well, which is great. So we're, we're, well, everyone's welcome. It's been a really worthwhile uh, event. Uh, let me just uh, bring out a few highlights that I found. I'm sure you uh, found others. Um, I, I found this session particularly illuminating, giving us uh, an, uh, an insight into the labor market and demystifying some of the trends and helping us to understand the difficulties of reading the data. Uh, so that's been terrific. Uh, I, I found the, the session on uh, objectives and effectiveness and governance of uh, central banks and accountability to be really uh, hugely uh, informative. Of course, we don't have the report yet, but even the evidence uh, sounded to me to be extremely uh, interesting. And I totally agree with uh, Kate Barker, who said that the quality and thought that goes into decisions is what matters. Uh, we hope, of course, that there's really good quality data behind it and, um, and uh, lots of analysis, but it's the thought process and the, the decision-making that really counts. And then the, um, the, the session on, uh, that we've had on monetary policy and the, uh, the keynotes, I think what comes out of those is the challenges that we have for monetary policy making and financial stability in the present period, a, a sequence of shocks. Um, globally, there have been, uh, there's been COVID followed by um, the inflation surge and various geopolitical risks. But of course, on top of that, in the UK, we've also had Brexit. And uh, that's led to uh, inflation uh, shifting from being around target or just below it to being multiples above it, uh, which creates all sorts of problems for monetary policy. And uh, on the financial stability side, the fiscal response to COVID has led to a situation where with higher interest rates for longer and leverage and amplification through the financial system, we have all sorts of uh, consequences that may emerge in the financial sector and in the real sector as far as growth is concerned. Um, let me close with uh, one observation which I think uh, Kristen made, which was really nice. Um, drawing on the fable, Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare, it seems, uh, at least so far, the hare is ahead. Um, not, and maybe the hare will win. Um, so the hare, is, uh, the hare central banks, the ones that uh, uh, raised rates the most, um, most quickly and most uh, decisively, have tended to bring their inflation down more than the tortoises that have been slow and steady. But let's see. Uh, the fable reminds us that uh, we shouldn't uh, draw conclusions too early. So um, anyway, it, there will be another one. There will be another one next year, the third one. And uh, we, we hope that uh, inflation will be lower in no November 2024 than it is now. Um, but I expect there will be just as many conundrums for us to think about and wrestle with and hopefully uh, equally good panellists to, uh, to answer those questions for us. Um, in terms of uh, just mentioning a few people who've made this happen, um, I'd like to thank David Aikman and Richard Barwell who helped to coordinate the conference um, and a number of people, uh, sports staff, Debs, Zainab, Halima, Faye and Rosie who uh, made sure that uh, everything was coordinated. So thank you very much for, uh, for your help. Uh, now everybody I think uh, deserves a... Um, an opportunity to, to relax. So if you'd like to make your way to uh, the Maxwell Library on the first floor at six o'clock, there'll be drinks and uh, something to eat. So uh, please do uh, join us up there and the cloakroom will be open until after that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.